Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the parathyroid glands and vitamin D. Okay, so we've now talked about uh, vitamin D and we've talked about the fact that when parathyroid hormone is released into the blood, one of the things that it's going to do is it's going to activate the production of the active form of vitamin D, which is 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. What we now want to see is how vitamin D is going to act with parathyroid hormone to further raise calcium level. Okay, so we've seen that parathyroid hormone has these effects on the kidneys to raise uh, free calcium concentration in the blood. What we're going to see is that both parathyroid hormone and 125-dihydroxy vitamin D are going to work together to activate bone resorption to release calcium uh, from the bone which will then go into the blood and increase the free calcium concentration. In addition, uh, we're going to see that 125-dihydroxy vitamin D has effects on the gastrointestinal system to increase uh, calcium absorption there and also increase phosphate absorption. But first, to bone. Okay, so what we're going to begin with then is a discussion of the structure of bone, because people are often quite uh, confused with the structure of bone. It's something that often you don't actually study the structure of bone in that much detail in medical curriculums. Okay, You study you know, the different bones of the body in a huge amount of diff detail in anatomy, but you don't really ever actually learn what the stuff is made up of. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to firstly go over the structure of bone and then what we'll talk about is the fact that bone is continually being remodeled by osteoblasts and osteoclasts that are on the surface of the bone. And then of course what we'll go through is how parathyroid hormone is going to shift the balance towards um, bone resorption over uh, bone deposition. Parathyroid hormone and 125-dihydroxy vitamin D I should have said. Okay, so, first the bone structure. So I might actually title this bone physiology firstly. Okay, right, so we'll begin with bone structure. So the first concept that I want to uh, teach you is the difference between cortical or compact bone and medullary or cancellous or spongy bone or even trabecular bone. There are loads of different names. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, a big recognisable long bone, uh, namely the femur, and we're going to chop it in half, okay, and have a look at what you'd see if you were to do so. So I'm going to take the distal end of the femur, the knee end of the femur, and I'm going to chop it in half and have a look at the cross section. So I'm going to actually do a sagittal plane, uh, oh sorry, not a sagittal plane, in fact a coronal plane. I'm going to do a coronal plane of the femur. So if you think about the orientation of the femur in the body, take a coronal plane down there and we're going to have a look at that cross section. So this is what we'd see. We'd see something like this. So here is the lateral epicondyle, uh, sorry, not the lateral epicondyle, the lateral condyle, I keep making mistakes. Okay, so we're looking here at the right femur, and we're taking a coronal section through it, and here is the right condyle, here is the, uh, sorry, the lateral condyle, here is the medial condyle, like so, and then here is the beginning of the shaft at the bottom. Okay, now, what we'd actually see then, if we uh, were to take a cross section and look through, is we'd see a cortical portion of bone which is very, very dense here. Okay, so this is also called compact bone, and like so. And then in the end, within the cortical bone, you then have bone that is much less dense, known as cancellous or medullary or trabecular or even spongy bone. And the way I'll show this is like so, with lots of little holes in amongst it. So it's more of a mesh work, like so, with lots of little holes, and if you were a little person you could sort of walk through these tunnels in the medullary bone here. The medullary bone then ends, and you'll have at the beginning of the cavity where the bone marrow is. Okay, so I'll just draw a few little hold, more holes here. Okay, so let me label up this picture then. So this portion, the outer portion of the bone, so uh, if you take your long bone, which is the femur in this case, the outer portion of that is made up of a very compact portion of bone, which is known as compact bone. So this type of very solid, very dense, 
um, no holes in it bone is known as compact bone and it's also called cortical bone. Cortical means around the edge so around the edge of all of your bones you have this type of bone, this very very dense, very solid compact bone. Okay, So all bones are lined by cortical or compact bone. And I'll just colour in this cortical compact bone here in green. So all of this on the uh, distal end of the femur is going to be this cortical or compact bone. Okay, and we will discuss what the actual structure of this is in a moment, but firstly I want to get this uh, concept of the difference between co compact or cortical bone and trabecular or medullary bone uh, out of the way. Okay, also I'll put on the picture the fact that we are looking at the femur here and that this uh, prominence at the distal end is known as the medial condyle of the femur and that the other one over here this is known as the lateral condyle so remember we're looking at the right femur so this is towards the midline which is here uh, so it's medial and this is away from the midline so this is the lateral condyle so we have the medial and lateral condyles of the femur shown here and we have taken a cross section that is actually going through the medial and lateral condyles Okay, then, this portion of bone that is within the cortical bone, it's in the middle, this is a different type of bone because this isn't as dense as this bone. It's made up of the same stuff, as we'll see, the microscopic structure is exactly the same, but the macroscopic structure, if you actually look at it, is different. It's much more porous. Water could flow through this, whereas water wouldn't be able to flow through this. You've got loads of little tunnels in between. Um, well, you've got a tunnel mesh work within this bone. Okay, it's like some creature has burrowed out tunnels in the bone. Okay, so you've got these trabeculae of bone, as they're called. Okay, so this sort of spider's mesh work, if you like, of bone then, with loads of spaces in between it, and those are sort of tunnels within it. This is known as trabecular bone. Okay, or it's also got loads of other names. So trabecular is describing the sort of mesh workiness of it. Okay, you can also call it medullary bone because it's in the middle rather than the outside. So that's the analogous thing to cortical here. You can also call it spongy because it resembles a sponge in some way. And there is one other word I think: trabecular, medullary, spongy, or oh, and cancellous is another name that you can use for it. Okay, so all of those uh, four descriptions, you can all use those, uh, you can use all four of those for this type of bone, which has a different macroscopic appearance to the cortical bone that lines the outside of bones. Okay, right, then the other thing that I've got here, and in fact I'll just colour in a bit of this, so here we'll, we'll colour in the cancellus or trabecular bone here in orange, and I'll avoid the holes because they're not bone, they're just spaces. Right, there we go. Okay, now the other thing that I've got shown here is this cavity here in the actual shaft of the femur, and this is the cavity where the bone marrow is going to be, so in red here you'll have bone marrow. Okay, right, so that's the first thing that I want to teach you. Uh, the difference between the medullary bone, or this trabecular bone, and the compact or cortical bone. Now, although the macroscopic appearance of these two different types of bone is different, the microscopic appearance is exactly the same. So the actual structure of the bone when you've got it in the trabecular bone here. So if you actually go to a little section of bone here, and a little section of bone here, and look at their microscopic structure, you will see the exact same thing. So it's just the macroscopic appearance that is different between these two different types of bone. They are not actually different types of bone. Their actual microscopic structure is not different. Okay, so uh, let's actually now discuss what the microscopic structure then is of bone. So bone is made up of two principal components known as the bone matrix and the bone uh, mineral. Okay, so let's firstly talk about what the bone matrix is. So the bone matrix is made up of loads of proteins and the protein that it is principally made up of is collagen. So the reason it's called the bone matrix is 
for the same reason that the connective mesh work that surrounds cells is called the extracellular matrix. And in fact, it's very similar to the extracellular matrix, and like the extracellular matrix, one of the principal components is collagen. Now, in the case of bone matrix, the principal component is collagen. Okay, really, uh, to keep things simple, we can say it's just made up of collagen fibers, and loads and loads of collagen fibers that are all in parallel with one another, all laid parallel in one another. Now I want to keep this piece of paper at the right height because if it, if I bring it up like that it makes the colours all, um, all go very sort of faint so that you can't see it properly. The camera doesn't like the contrast with the black table uh, so I want to try and keep the page um, dominating the camera. Okay, right. Uh, so, bone matrix then. Back to bone matrix. So, bone matrix is going to be made up of loads of collagen fibres all laid in parallel with one another. Now, these collagen fibres are principally in bone made up of type 1 collagen molecules. Now, let me just explain what a type 1 collagen molecule is. So, collagen fibres are made up of absolutely loads of collagen molecules. Now, you might uh, wonder, is a collagen molecule then just a single protein, a single polypeptide? Well, the answer is no. A collagen molecule means actually three proteins wound into a triple helix. And a type 1 collagen molecule is a triple helix involving a specific combination of three proteins that we're going to wind around. So to make a type 1 collagen molecule, what you're going to do is you're going to take two alpha 1 proteins and one alpha 2 protein. So this is a, an alpha 1 collagen protein and this is an alpha 2 collagen protein. So these are the individual polypeptides. So this is an actual polypeptide, a sequence of amino acids all joined together. We're going to take two alpha 1 polypeptides, we're going to take one alpha 2 collagen polypeptide, uh, and we're now going to wind these together. Okay, so here is, let's say, one. Okay. And what we're going to do is then wind it up with the other. And then finally we're going to put in the third one. So we're going to intertwine these polypeptides together to make what is called a triple helix. And this is the way that you construct collagen molecules. You take uh, three collagen polypeptides of various types, wind them all together to make this structure known as a triple helix here. And this triple helix is then what's called a collagen molecule. Now all of the different types of collagen molecules, we're talking about type 1 collagen molecules, they refer to which combination of collagen proteins, collagen polypeptides, have you actually used to make the triple helix. So a type 1 collagen molecule is one that is made by taking two alpha 1 collagen polypeptides and one alpha 2 collagen polypeptide, wrapping them around to make the triple helix. There you have your type 1 collagen molecule. Now let's go over what is meant by collagen fiber. A collagen fiber is much bigger than a collagen molecule. A collagen fiber is a massive great length, a massive great string-like structure that is made out of loads of type 1 collagen molecules all glued together. So you're going to take Let's say here is a type 1 collagen molecule. You're then going to connect this to other type 1 collagen molecules. So you're going to connect loads of these type 1 collagen molecules together, like so. So loads of them will get connected all together. And then you'll make a massive great uh, string here. And that's what's known as a collagen fiber. So a collagen fiber is loads of type 1 collagen molecules all joined together. Okay, right, so I hope it's clear then what is meant by a collagen molecule and a collagen fibre. So bone matrix is going to be made up of loads of collagen fibres. And I'm now going to denote a single collagen fibre in blue here. So you're going to have all of the collagen fibres running in parallel like so. So here they are running in parallel. And this is what is meant by the bone matrix. So loads and loads of collagen fibres running in parallel together like so. Okay, now all be con they all have connections between one another. Now there is another name for bone matrix. It's also often referred to as osteoid. Uh, so if you hear anyone referring to osteoid, that's just another name for bone matrix. 
Okay, so there's another key component of bone beyond the bone matrix, however, which is the bone mineral. So now let's go to the other key component of bone, which is bone mineral. Now, bone mineral is an ionic compound known as hydroxyapatite, and hydroxyapatite is what consists of the calcium. So we know that we have a huge amount of calcium stored in bone. The calcium is going to be part of the bone mineral. It's going to be part of the ionic crystal that is going to intertwine with the collagen matrix here. Okay, so bone mineral, the specific ionic crystal that's going to uh, form amongst the collagen fibers then here is known as hydroxyapatite. Okay, and this uh, has a, well, it consists of three different ions, namely calcium ions, phosphate ions, and hydroxide ions, and they are in the stoichiometry 10 calcium ions, so Ca10, to 6 phosphate ions, so here are the phosphate ions, and I might just put the charges on here, so calcium 2 plus, phosphate 3 minus, so the true phosphate ions, 6 of those, and then 2 hydroxide anions, which have a single negative charge. Okay, and that balances all the charge, because we have 10 calcium ions, that's a plus 20 charge, uh, 6 phosphate ions, that's a negative 18 charge, 2 hydroxide ions, that's a negative 2 charge, so overall uh, they're balancing out. So that's the ratio, but hydroxyapatite is going to be a massive great crystal. It's just going to go on and on and on, and it's going to consist of calcium ions bound to phosphate ions and hydroxyl, uh, sorry, hydroxide anions. Okay, so this is going to just spread on and on, forming a massive great crystal. So yes, it will be substantially more complex than sodium chloride, but you should imagine those lattices of sodium and chloride ions that you will have seen long ago uh, when you study chemistry, okay? It goes on and on and on, so it's just a much more complicated version of that, a massive great lattice of ions all held together by their electrostatic attraction. And basically what's going to happen is we're going to take the bone matrix here, the osteoid, and we're going to mineralize it to actually form bone, and you're going to establish this crystal, hydroxyapatite here, amongst the bone matrix here. So I will try and show this uh, by yellow dots here. So you're going to have, oh actually that's not going to show up at all, especially in uh, these lighting conditions. So I'll have it in orange dots instead. Um, so you're going to have ions all over the place, all interacting uh, with each other with electrostatic interactions, and they'll also be interacting with residues in the collagen fibers. So there are loads of amino acids that might have charges in the collagen fibers, and those will also be able to interact with these ions. So you're going to have loads of these ions amongst uh, the bone matrix, and this is going to actually make the bone now. So once you've got the uh, bone mineral with the bone matrix, we say that the uh, osteoid or the bone matrix has been mineralized. Okay, right, so that will do as far as our picture is concerned, and that is what bone majorly consists of. A bone matrix, loads and loads of parallel collagen fibres with this bone mineral, this hydroxyapatite consisting of calcium, phosphate, and hydroxide anions amongst uh, the um, collagen fibres. Okay, and that is incredibly strong, it's incredibly strong, and it gives rise to this hard structure that we know as bone. Now, there are a few other things amongst uh, the sea of matrix and mineral uh, that you should be aware of that's in bone. Indeed, there are actually some cells, okay, known as osteocytes, and these have long uh, processes known as canaliculi, which interconnect with other osteocytes. So amongst the bone matrix and the bone mineral, you do have cells within bone. Okay, uh, so here I'm drawing a picture of one of these. So these cells are known as osteocytes. So osteo means pertaining to the bone, site means cell, so the cells of the bone. And I'll draw this osteocyte and colour it in now in red here. So here are these processes of the osteocyte. And these processes have a fancy name, they're known as canaliculi. Okay, so these long processes coming off the major cell body of the osteocyte, these are known as canaliculi. 
okay, or singular canaliculus. And these are for communicating with other osteocytes. So we might have another osteocyte down here, and you can see that their processes are touching and they can communicate with one another. So here is another osteocyte with its canaliculus connecting with the canaliculus of this osteocyte. Okay, so if we've got cells within the bone, then we're also going to have to have blood vessels. So indeed, you do also have blood vessels in the bone. You will have some capillaries also there. So that's another structure to add on to this picture. So that's now the structure of bone, the microscopic structure of bone completed. You've got the bone matrix with the bone mineral amongst it, and then dotted around the base you've got osteocytes, and the osteocytes are all connecting with other osteocytes to form a great sort of meshwork of osteocytes. And then amongst uh, all of this you've got capillaries which are feeding the osteocytes. Okay, now let's talk about the surface of bone. So the surface of bone, where there is the edge of bone, okay, so I'll show you some edges of bone. So of course, this is an edge of bone. Also, in the cancellous bone, we've got loads of edges of bone. This is an edge of the bone. This is an edge of the bone. So at these edges, these borders, the ends of where the, where the bone ends, uh, what you're going to have is a layer of cells known as bone lining cells. Okay, so you have a single layer of cells surrounding the extreme edge of a bone, uh, and these are known as bone lining cells. However, you also have two other really important cell types on the edges of bone, and these are known as um, osteoclasts and osteoblasts, and I'm going to come on to those now. So bone lining cells are the boring cells on the edge of bone. Now what we're going to talk about is the interesting cells, the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Okay, right. So now let's talk about osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So firstly, let me draw a picture of an osteoblast, and let me draw your picture of an osteoclast. So osteoblasts are a reasonably normal-looking cell. They're going to be sitting on the edge of the bone. So here is the surface that will be in contact with the bone. So the bone will be here. Okay, and they have a single nucleus, so they're a mononucleated cell. Okay, so we'll have our osteoblast then coloured in in green here. Osteoclasts are an odd cell because they have multiple nuclei, they are multinucleated cells. Okay, so they're a bit of a giant of cells. And as we'll see, osteoclasts actually come from uh, loads of other cells that have all fused together. So precursors to osteoclasts, known as pre-osteoclasts, fused together to make this giant of a cell, which is an osteoclast here. And the result is that an osteoclast is going to have multiple nuclei from all of the different cells that contributed to actually making it. Okay, so here is my picture of an osteoclast then, and these also sit on the surface of bone. Okay, and they will interrupt the layer of bone lining cells. So you'd usually have these boring cells, known as bone lining cells, covering the edge of the bone, but you also have dotted around the place these osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Now osteoblasts and osteoclasts are not static. They are mobile. They move around over the surface of the bone, and as they move, the bone lining cells will get out of their way. Okay, so if this osteoblast wanted to move in this direction, these bone lining cells would move out of the way. They part, um, so clearing the path so that the osteoblast can move along the surface of the bone. So not just osteoblasts can do this, osteoclasts can also do this. So osteoblasts and osteoclasts, you can imagine them whizzing around on the surface of the bone with bone lining cells moving out of their way. So they are mobile cells. So, what then is the function of osteoblasts and osteoclasts? Well, they take part in the process which is known as bone remodelling that occurs continuously even in the adult. And bone remodelling involves the breakdown of bone and then the replacement of bone. Okay, Osteoclasts are the ones which break bone down and osteoblasts are the ones which deposit bone um, back. Okay, they form bone back. And the fancy words for breaking bone down and putting bone back are bone resorption is what osteoclasts do. So if you wanted to uh, fancily say what osteoclasts uh, function is, you'd say that their function is bone resorption. 
and the function of osteoblasts, uh, their function is bone deposition. That's the fancy way of saying it. So osteoclasts make bone, osteo sorry, osteoblasts make bone, osteoclasts break bone down. So how do they do this? Well, let's start with how osteoblasts make bone. Osteoblasts synthesize osteoid. They synthesize type 1 collagen molecules and uh, collagen fibers and then secrete them uh, to produce the osteoid. So they secrete the collagen fibers that are actually going to make uh, the osteoid. In addition, they secrete the ions that are going to make hydroxyapatite. So they will have little granules fill up with calcium and phosphate uh, and they will secrete those out uh, onto the osteoid that they've just produced to produce the bone mineral as well. So osteoblasts are going to create bone then by creating the osteoid and releasing the bone mineral so that the ions uh, which make the uh, ionic lattice of hydroxyapatite are in very high concentration at the osteoid that needs mineralizing. Osteoclasts, meanwhile, they do the exact opposite. They release acid uh, molecules, lots of very high concentration of protons, uh, to uh, break down the ionic crystals. So remember, uh, releasing a very high free proton concentration onto an ionic crystal has the tendency to break the ionic crystal apart. So osteoclasts release acid onto the bone to break the hydroxyapatite apart. Uh, they also then release enzymes which will break down the osteoid proteins. So enzymes which will start to break down the collagen fibers and therefore break down the osteoid. So osteoclasts are continuously breaking bone down. Osteoblasts are then going behind the osteoclasts and remaking that bone. Okay? And this is a continuous process. So all over the body, Osteoclasts will be breaking bone down and osteoblasts will be replacing it and the process is normally in equilibrium. So normally the rate at which osteoclasts are breaking the bone down will be matched by the rate at which the osteoblasts are reforming bone. What we are going to do with parathyroid hormone and the activated form of vitamin D, 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D, is we're going to shift that balance. We are going to increase the osteoclast activity, and we are going to, well, we're going to increase the osteoclast activity. We're not actually going to decrease the osteoblast activity that much. Okay, we are going to increase the osteoclast activity so that they now dominate over the osteoblasts, okay? and uh, therefore you're going to get a decrease, well, you're going to get overall a net bone resorption and that's going to release calcium into the bloodstream. So if you've got net bone resorption, calcium is going to be released from the bone into the bloodstream and that will help to bring free calcium level up. Okay, so in the next video what we'll actually do is have a look at the mechanism by which parathyroid hormone and 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D do indeed lead to an increase in osteoclast activity. And it's not quite as direct as you would think. In fact, what's going to happen is the parathyroid hormone and the 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D are going to act on the osteoblasts. Okay, surprisingly, you'd think they're going to have to act on the osteoclast, but no, they act on the osteoblasts and they tell the osteoblasts to tell the osteoclasts to increase their activity. They also tell the osteoblasts to call for more osteoclasts. So parathyroid hormone and 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D are going to act on osteoblasts and they're going to get the osteoblasts to call for more osteoclasts. So we're going to call for more pre-osteoclasts which will then fuse together to make osteoclasts on the surface of bone and they're also going to activate the osteoclasts that are already there. Overall, that will increase osteoclast activity. Osteoblast activity has remained the same, therefore they're no longer in balance. Osteoclast activity is going to beat osteoblast activity, so we're going to get net bone resorption, and that calcium uh, that's released from the hydroxyapatite will go into the blood and help bring up free calcium concentration. So you can look forward to the explanation of that in the next video.